Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction Company taking a look at some of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming April of 2019 premiere auction. What we have today here is the French World War I heavy machine gun. This is the Hotchkiss model of 1914. Uh, it wasn't the only heavy French machine gun during World War I. They also used substantial numbers of the 1907 Saint-Étienne machine gun, which, by the way, I have a previous video on, uh, which you should definitely check out after this one, because it's interesting to put the two guns side by side to comparison. But uh, this was the most heavily produced and uh, really the mainstay of the French army during World War I. So what we have here is an air-cooled, strip-fed heavy machine gun. So it did feed from 30 round metallic feed strips. We'll talk about the pros and cons of those compared to cloth belts in a moment. Um, ironically, this is actually uh, an invention that originated with an Austrian guy, an Austrian army officer by the name of Adolf von Oudkolek, uh, who in the 1890s came up with a patent for this gas piston operated gun. And uh, he didn't have the, the capacity to manufacture it himself. And so he went to Paris in the 1890s and approached the Hotchkiss Company, which uh, had a, an excellent reputation at that point for making guns. They'd been making um, the Hotchkiss revolving cannon. It was probably their most successful product. And anyway, he brought the gun to them, and what he wanted to do was license them to manufacture his gun. Well, the two guys, uh, two guys at Hotchkiss took a look at it. These were Laurence Benet, who was an American living in France uh, as chief engineer for the company. Uh, Hotchkiss had been founded by an American, Benjamin Hotchkiss, although he had passed away by the time this was happening. Uh, and then also uh, Benet's assistant, a guy named Laurence Mercier, who was a Frenchman also working for the company. And they took a look at this patent of Old Collex, and they realized, they, they decided, you know what? His gun's kind of crap. Uh, we don't want to make this, it's not going to work well. However, the mechanical system at the heart of this gun, which he has patented, is very interesting. This is a system that allows us to bypass, like we can build this based on his patent without infringing on Colt or Maxim patents. And those are the other two companies uh, heavily involved in manufacturing heavy machine guns at this point. And Hotchkiss wanted to get in on this new growing business. So, uh, they bought out Hotchkiss's, they bought out Odecollect's patent, and then modified the gun to be their own design. Uh, they, they took his mechanical system, turned it into their own gun, which came out initially in 1897. And even in 1897 it looked very much like this. Um, really the most notable difference is these, these rings, which they put on there to absorb heat. The idea was, it's an air-cooled gun, it's going to get hot. What can we do to mitigate that? Well, we can increase surface area and increase mass. And what this does is simply uh, increase the amount of thermal energy that the barrel can absorb before it actually increases in temperature enough to be a problem. Um, in fact, it's interesting that the official manual for using this gun talks about how you, you fire such and so many rounds and then within a certain time period, and then you, you give the gun a rest while you sponge this down with water uh, to, <laughs> to suck the heat out of those barrel rings. Well, anyway, the early guns, the 1897s, these barrel rings were actually made out of brass. 1900 they decided, nah, that's, that's a little excessive, we can just use steel and it will work just as well. Um, they, as I was getting to, they improved the guns a bit in 1900. Uh, they, they changed this over to steel. There were some problems with the gas piston. It had been a bit fragile in the early guns, and they, they strengthened that. And then they proceeded to actually sell these things relatively widely on the international market. Uh, they sold them to a bunch of countries in South America. They sold them into Scandinavia. Uh, they sold them to Japan. Japan would actually become a, a big proponent of the Hotchkiss system. Uh, and they would not only buy some of these, but then they would license and further copy the design for both light and heavy machine guns. The Type 11s, the Type 3s, the Type 92s, all of those guns are, are uh, you know, derived from the original Hotchkiss. At any rate, sold them to Japan. Uh, and they actually sold a number of them to the French government as well, in particular for colonial service. So the other guns that were out there at the time, uh, in particular the Maxim gun, which was the world standard for heavy machine guns, are water-cooled guns. Well, many of the French colonial interests at this time are in northern Africa, and there's not necessarily a lot of water in northern Africa. And if you take something like a water-cooled Maxim gun, and you try to shoot a significant volume of fire through it without having water in that barrel jacket, it will overheat very quickly. Uh, because it uses the water for cooling, it has a very light profile barrel. 
uh, inside. So without the water, that's a problem, and uh, it would really suck to send off a, you know, an expeditionary force into the Sahara and have them discover that, oh, our machine guns don't work, because we don't have any spare water for them. So that's why the French were interested in this for colonial use. Now, when World War I breaks out, actually I should back up a step, they weren't interested in this gun for general army use, because, to be just blatant about it, they were too cheap to pay for the royalties. They figured they could have a gun built by uh, the French state arsenals, uh, which they owned the rights to everything that was done in there, and, uh, and then they could have a more efficient, uh, more cost-effective system for building machine guns. Well, this resulted in the development of the 1905 Puteaux and the 1907 saint -Tienne. Uh The saint in particular is kind of like take a Hotchkiss gun and then reverse how everything works so that it's doing the same thing but it doesn't infringe on the patents. That's kind of the saint -Tienne. Uh, however, once we get to 1914, war breaks out, the saint is in fact a particularly expensive gun to manufacture, and the French military realizes we're going to need a lot more of these guns. And so at that point they decide to adopt the Hotchkiss, uh, the, formerly as the model of 1914 Hotchkiss. So they made two significant changes between the commercial 1900s and the military 1914s. Uh, those would be, one, they got rid of the shoulder stock. The original guns didn't have this D-ring handle on the back, they had a pistol grip and a, a rather intricate shoulder stock attached to the top cover here. They changed that out for the D-ring, um, because the shoulder stocks weren't considered uh, necessary, and they were big and bulky. Uh, and then they also simplified the mechanism for, getting, for taking the barrel off. Uh, they went from a split pin on the 1900s to a rotary lever on the 1914s. So. Um, with that background in mind, one of the particularly impressive things about this gun is its disassembly. There are a minimum number of parts, despite how funky and big and complicated it looks, it actually has very few parts in it, requires no tools be besides possibly a hammer to disassemble, no screws, no pins. It's a pretty cool disassembly, so let me go ahead and show you that. We have uh, the major markings on the side of the receiver here. Uh, Mitrailleu Automatique Hotchkiss, uh, Hotchkiss Automatic Machine Gun, Brevet SGDG, basically means it's patented, but you know the government guarantees the patent but doesn't guarantee that it'll work, that's just a standard legalistic thing. And then caliber, 8mm. Uh, these were made in a, a wide variety of other calibers for other countries. On the other side of the receiver we have the serial number and the date. Uh, Hotchkiss had one continuous serial number run of these guns. Uh, 35,000 would put this at probably early 1918. Uh, this is, by the way, in contrast to the saint Tien guns, uh, where they started a new serial number range every year. In terms of operation, it is a very simple gun. There is no manual safety, there is no semi-automatic feature, there is a trigger. You pull the trigger, and it fires. There is a nice chunky charging handle here. Lock the gun open, push the charging handle back forward, that's really a, a pretty standard machine gun order of operations, then you're ready to fire. This is truly a 19th century style of gun. Uh, you saw the brass pistol grip, there's also this intricately cast brass feed block, and then of course we have 24 round feed strips for actually shooting. Unlike the Hotchkiss Portative, these go up, these insert into the gun with the bullets uh, on the upward side of the strip, which is nice. On the portative guns, with the strip hanging over this way, you have the risk of rounds falling out as the strip gets jostled around. This goes in uh, much more nicely. So slide this guy in. There were a couple reasons to use metallic feed strips. Um, they weren't prone to deterioration, especially in wet weather. Um, these are easier to store than belts that flop around. You can have a case full of 24 round feed strips. In theory, you can actually link these together end to end while feeding to get kind of a continuous feed. I'm not sure how, how practical that was in, in actual service. Uh, however, it's also important to remember that these are crew served guns, and so you don't have one guy who has to alternate between shooting 24 rounds and then, you know, finding another strip and loading it into the gun. No, you have a, a, a loader whose job is to, as soon as one strip goes in the gun, he fishes out the next one and he's there waiting and ready to feed the next strip into the gun. So uh, this was absolutely capable of maintaining every bit as heavy a rate of fire as a Maxim gun. 
Now the tripod that this is mounted on currently is actually an American production tripod. This was uh, made by a company called Standard Products, and they only made like 2500 of them. Most of them have been scrapped. Uh, I don't think they actually saw combat service. The French had a, a substantially different, what they called an omnibus uh, tripod, that was uh, fitted out for both the Saint-Étienne and the Hotchkiss guns. So this is an interesting one. It's, it's a bit of a rarer model of tripod, and at the same time though it's maybe not as historically relevant. Uh, it does offer a full 360 degree rotation. You have your elevation wheel here uh, to elevate and depress the gun. And you can also take the gun out of its uh, mounting trunnions, uh, flip it around, elevate the whole tripod, and use it in an anti-aircraft roll. The rear sight is actually marked uh, House pour Cartouche Model 1886D. Uh, that was the standard cartridge that was in use, uh, the standard model of 8mm Lebel cartridge in use by the French military during World War I. Uh, these guns did stay in service and would be refitted or uh, have the chambers reamed out for the Ball 1932N later on, although this particular gun has not had that done to it. The sight is graduated out to 2000 meters, and what's pretty cool here is you can see these two little holes. Those were actually for a, uh, a luminous glow-in-the-dark paint. Uh, the French in introduced night sights. In fact, the French and the Germans both used uh, luminous night sights during World War I, which I think a lot of people maybe don't realize. And uh, so they, as a standard practice, about halfway through the war they started adding those sights to all of the machine guns. The matching front sight there, also with its uh, little more intact uh, luminous front sight. The Saint-Étienne machine gun had introduced this big cow catcher looking uh, flash hider, which was really quite elaborate. Um, those were used on these guns as well, but they also had this uh, kind of much more typical low profile simple cone flash hider. This is a gas piston operated gun, so this is your massive gas block here on the gun, and then it does actually have an adjustable piston in it, or an adjustable gas port. So you can adjust more or less gas depending on the condition of the gun and the condition of your ammunition. I think it's kind of funny to note that uh, you know, on, on a lot of the French rifles the, the parts that the individual trooper was not supposed to disassemble were manufactured with these split screws so that you, a normal screwdriver couldn't be used to take them out. Uh, here we have the same sort of philosophy there, uh, where the gas, the adjustable gas system actually goes into the gas block is only for armorers to mess with, and uh, they have actually uh, stamped or engraved on here, Demontage Interdit, uh, do not disassemble. All right, now we can start disassembly, which is pretty slick on this thing. So the first step is to remove the feed block, and there is a little split pin right here that is going to allow us to do that. However, I need to persuade it just a little bit. There we go. So this is at a wedge. See that right there. That's a wedge that locks the feed block in place. And once it's removed, I can then open the bolt. And just pull the whole feed block assembly out. Next up I need to remove the top cover and rear handle, which means I have to pull this plug out. If I push in this little button right there, I can then pull the plug out. The top cover comes right off. This is our mainspring guide, top cover, D-handle. I can then pull out the recoil spring. Next up I'm going to go ahead and take off the uh, charging handle. This just slides backward in a dovetail, like that. So it goes up, slides in. Another really cool solid cast piece of brass there. And then the trigger just comes out as well, along with its return spring. And now I can use the charging handle to pull the internals out. There we go. This is our bolt, gas piston, and op rod. In theory we could also pull the barrel off at this point. Um, what you would do is simply pivot this up 90 degrees, 
uh, that unlocks uh, the barrel, and then you can rotate it this direction. You can see that stop would actually rotate down into the receiver here, and then the barrel comes off, just has an interrupted thread in there. However, this one's quite tight on there, and without a big wrench uh, I'm not going to do that uh, for today's video. But that's how it would have been done. And this is one of those two, in fact probably the more significant of the two improvements that were made for the 1914 pattern military Hotchkiss. Oh, and last but not least, I can now take the charging handle off. So really, I mean, this is an incredibly intricate uh, receiver here. The amount of work that went into this thing is remarkable. Um, however, what they ended up with as a result was a gun that is extremely easy to disassemble. It is made of all quite robust parts, and not very many of them. And it is a gun that had a very well-deserved reputation for being pretty much unbreakable. Uh, this is it. This is all of the internal parts. You know, you were used to seeing, you know, a couple of small pins or something. Well, you got that. Um, take a look at this guy. This is halfway between firing pin and like tent stake. There's no way that is going to break. We can go into a brief bit of detail here about how this actually mechanically works. Uh, this is the bolt, bolt face up there, and a pivoting locking block. So the, the actual locking surfaces are these two right here, and this sits on our op rod, uh, somewhat similar to the Lewis gun, although this came before the Lewis. There we go. And as this cycles, the, the gas piston will go backwards, which will lift that locking block up, cycle backwards, when it comes forward, it will come forward until the gas piston hits its end of travel, or until the, I'm sorry, until the bolt face hits its end of travel. The gas piston keeps going, and this giant cam surface there forces the locking block down, where these two surfaces engage against a pair of recesses in the receiver. At the same time, we have a firing pin here that's inside the bolt. It's being held by the operating rod right there. So as soon as the op rod starts moving backward, the firing pin is retracted into the bolt face and can't fire. And then uh, likewise when it's coming forward, this firing pin is held back out of the bolt face until, there we go, until the bolt is all the way rearward, which means all the way locked. You probably noticed all these odd cam surfaces in the op rod. Those are there to actually operate the feed block. So our feed block here has these pawls on it, uh, which cause this sprocket to rotate, which causes it to pull the feed strip into the gun. So the feed strip is going to start right here. We have this prevents it from going backwards, and this actually pulls it forwards. So I have a lever on the bottom right here. I push that up, I can drop the initial, the, the reverse stop. I can then put a strip in, like so. Um, there is a control on here, right there. Uh, in this position it's, it's ready to shoot, and in this position the sprocket is locked and can only be operated by the op rod. So uh, if you want to remove a partially fired strip, you pull this out, then the sprocket rotates freely, and you can pull the strip out the back. In total, uh, the French would manufacture 45,850 of these during World War I. Uh, production started off a bit slowly and then ramped up towards the end of the war, and it kind of was balanced against production of the 1907 saint Etienne, which uh, was higher at the beginning, and then they kind of ramped down the 1907 as they were able to scale up production of these. Um, although they did make a lot of 1907s, there was a total production of about 35,000 1907s. So uh, they made quite a lot of these, and these would actually stay in French service all the way through World War II. Uh, after World War, in the aftermath of World War I, the French immediately understood that the 8mm Lebel cartridge was obsolete and needed to be replaced. Um, the heavy taper, the rim, these were major problems for, in particular, light machine guns and self-loading rifles. And so by 1924 they had adopted a rimless cartridge, and they almost immediately developed and adopted a light machine gun to go with it, that being the Châtellerault 2429. They then looked into developing uh, infantry rifles for the new rimless cartridge, and that would lead to the M34 conversion of the Berthier and the Moss 36 rifle. However, they never really got around to replacing the heavy machine guns with a 7.5. So these were never actually converted to 7.5. They remained in 8mm Lebel through World War II, uh, and it was only in, in the aftermath of World War II with the development of the AA-52 
Um, really not, not a direct replacement for the Hotchkiss, because by the late 40s everyone kind of understood that a heavy machine gun, a rifle caliber heavy machine gun like this, was an obsolete concept. And so these were removed, and the AA-52s, as more of a general purpose machine gun, uh, were brought in. So, um, a pretty iconic gun of World War I. Uh, I should also point out the Allied, the American Expeditionary Force uh, used primarily Hotchkiss heavy machine guns as their heavies. Uh, the US military received 5,255 of these guns, uh, and, and, and used them to great effect uh, in the late stages of World War I. Now, uh, pretty cool to get a chance to take a look at this one, it's in pretty nice shape. Um, if you're interested in having it yourself, of course it is coming up for sale here. This is a fully transferable, uh, registered, NF NFA registered uh, machine gun, so purchasing it requires going through the NFA transfer process. If you're interested in doing that, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Morphe's catalog page for this gun, where you can take a look at their pictures, their description, their price estimate, all that sort of stuff. Place a bid for it right there online, or uh, go ahead and just browse through the catalog and take a look at all the other cool stuff they have as well. Thanks for watching.